Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Please raise your hand if you did not get a red mark for today, the 5th of October. At this stage in your mathematical careers, we've generated two different definitions for the derivative. And while they're similar, right, they are, they are different as well, depending upon how we interpret them. So we're going to go ahead and write the x approaches c definition and the h approaches zero definitions of the derivative. And then how are the two definitions conceptually different? So go ahead and share with the class our x approaches c definition with a limit. What does that look like with the limit? Jake? Uh, limit of the f prime c equals the limit of x as it approaches c of f of x minus f of c over x minus c. Awesome. Raise your hand if you have the same x approach c definition that Jake had. That's absolutely right. Go ahead and share with the class my limit as h approaches zero definition. So what does that look like with x's and h's and limits? What does that look like? Allie? Um, f prime h equals uh, f of x plus h minus f of x over h. I'm sorry, the limit of h. Awesome, Allie. And is this going to give me f prime of h or f prime of x or f prime of c, right? What's going to be here in my, my argument, my input, right? What's my input going to be there? Anna? X. X, absolutely. And so this second derivative, f prime of h, is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Absolutely right. Thank you, Allie. Raise your hand if you have the same, the same f prime of x as Allie. We have that good. So how are these how are these definitions conceptually similar? How are they different? Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at our two definitions. And they're certainly similar, right? They both involve that same sort of um, limit expression. We've got this this difference, right? This difference in the quotient in each case. But how are they conceptually different, right? So what are some differences here, Riley? Um, well. That equation, uh, x approaches c, and I'll find the derivative at, at a value of the function. But uh, the h approaches 0 will find the entire equation. The entire equation for the derivative function. Yeah, absolutely. Riley, I think you summed up the main difference there very nicely. So I'll go ahead and use the same colors here. Our x approaches c definition, I'll abbreviate like this. So our x approaches c definition will give the derivative value at one particular point. So this gives derivative value at one particular point. Three, the instantaneous rate of change of my function is negative 4.5, right? Versus the h approaches 0 definition, which I'll abbreviate as quotations h goes to 0 definition, that gives a function, a derivative function, an expression with variables in it that I could then use to find derivative values at multiple points, right? Or uh, interpret as a function in its own right with a domain and range and increasing or decreasing behavior, etc. So this gives an entire derivative function. Complete with a, a rule, right? Like an equation, uh, a domain, uh, a range, and then I can use that function to get values. Now, they both have their pros and cons. In certain situations, the x goes to c definition, right? I would argue it is more efficient. Uh, and algebraically often simplifies more easily. Uh, if I'm going to be using multiple derivative values or want to interpret the entire original function, um, then I think the h approaches 0 would do a better job because it gives an entire function that I could then use and interpret the original with, with the corresponding domain, etc. And so it depends what it is that you're trying to do. Bless you. These definitions are going to be the subject of our first Moodle 
Moodle discussion forum post this week. So uh, this is our first week. Normally, we do an original post and a reply to a classmate. This week, we're just going to do the original, the original post. You're certainly welcome to reply to a classmate if you like, um, but you're not required to this week. And then each subsequent week, we'll have two posts. So again, we'll talk about that uh, window in a minute. But first, let's go ahead and apply our shortcut rules. So be ready to share with the class. Now, as a result of completing our 3-4 activity, right, an easier way to find the derivative function, we can now apply our shortcut rules. And so I don't want to minimize the importance of those proofs on the extra handout from last activity. They were long. They were involved, right? They were detailed uh, and, well, a bit abstract, right? However, I don't want to diminish their importance by saying, you know, go ahead and gloss over your nine stamp. We're not going to do your nine stamp anymore. Go ahead and gloss over the justifications of number 10. I don't want to diminish the importance of those proofs. Those proofs are certainly important. In fact, they would allow us to now use the power rule forever after, right? They would allow us to use the derivative of a sum of individual functions and so on and so forth. And so they're super important. It's just that I didn't want you to get it caught up on our shortened class period with homecoming uh, assembly. I didn't want you to get it caught up, right, with the the line by line justifications, right? Instead, I wanted you to focus in on the big picture, and that was now being able to apply the power rule forever after. That's, so that's great. All right, let's go ahead and go term by term. Then the derivative with respect to x. Go ahead and share with the class. Then when I call on you, what would the derivative of x to the sixth minus four x be as a function? Right? What would that look like, Paul? Uh, 6 times x to the 5th minus 4. Raise your hand if you have the same as Paul in blue. 6x to the 5th minus 4. Woohoo! Good job! What's the derivative of 3x to the 4th plus 11? What would that look like? Nikki? 12x. And nothing else? What happened to the 11? This, this is a constant, right? A constant, and the derivative of any constant is zero. So good, you're absolutely right, Nikki. It's only 12x cubed. The derivative of any constant is zero. Nice job. What's the derivative with respect to r of 4, par r, 4 pi r squared? So 4 pi r squared, we can take the derivative of that with respect to r. What would that look like? What would that look like? Jake? Uh, 8 pi r. 8 pi r is correct. Raise your hand if you have 8 pi r for the third, 8 pi r. Great job. And lastly, the derivative with respect to x of 2x to the fifth minus pi cubed. What would that look like? What would that look like? Sophia? Um, 10x to the Are you stopping? Yes. Good. <laughs> pi cubed is just a constant, right? It's just a constant. And so while we have an exponent here, and don't be tempted to apply the power rule and get 3 pi squared because pi cubed is just a number like this 11, right? That differentiates to 0. And the derivative of any constant, right, is 0. Nice job, you guys. Raise your hand if you have 10x to the fourth for that last one. 10x to the fourth. Awesome. This is a little preview of next class. We've got something special to look forward to next class. Mental derivatives, where we're going to use the random number generator, the calculator, to call on you at random, and you're going to share derivatives with the whole class, right? With the whole class to make sure that we're all memorizing our rules now as we develop them over the course of the next several weeks. You need to be ready with your rules. You need to start your little baggie of flashcards, right? We get the neon flashcards where you write the power rule on, on the front and on the back side. You could have the derivative of x to the n equals n times x to the n minus 1, stuff like that. Now I know, right, you're sitting around, you're sitting around Subway, right, you've got to, you're reaching in your pocket, you're pull out your little, your little baggie, your baggie of derivative shortcut rules for AP Calculus, right, and you start quizzing each other at the table. Now I've seen it happen, you might think, yeah, right, like I'm going to do that. After two weeks, once we start getting, you know, nine, ten of these rules floating around, you want to make sure that you are practicing those. And so you can always take your little colored flashcard AP Calculus derivative shortcut rule baggie with you wherever you go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, next class for the first time this year, mental derivatives, right? Mental derivatives. And so we'll be using mental derivatives next class to make sure that everybody's staying sharp with their skills. This week, we're going to be participating in our first Moodle discussion forum. So several of you have already posted. Thanks to those of you who already posted. Every Monday morning, I'll push out a prompt, right, that will give you the setup for this week's discussion um, forum. 
This week, you'll get three points for a thoughtful response to my prompt. And we're going to test the settings to make sure everyone can post. And then next week, we'll have the original, the original post uh, due by Thursday, 11.59 p.m. Moodle time. And then you're going to pick a classmate to respond to in accordance with the directions in my original prompt as well. You're going to pick a classmate to reply to to further the discussion. And that's another two points. And that's by Sunday, 11.59 p.m. Moodle time in order to be points eligible. So this week, once again, you just have to do the original one. Now, if you'd like to include uh, a GIF or an image or something like that along with your post, that's great because you're going to be finding a celebrity, right? A celebrity that corresponds to each of our definitions from Bellwork for the derivative. The X approaches C definition and the H approaches zero definition. So based on the celebrity you pick, you want to say why does the celebrity you chose correspond to that definition? The, the purpose then, right, is now to not only to test our settings to make sure that we all get it, uh, it's also to see what she, uh, which derivative is useful uh, and when, right, and they both have their pros and cons. I did subscribe everyone to the Moodle forum, but I made that optional. So this first week, right, when you go to check your school email or whatever email you've linked with your Moodle account, you might get a whole bunch of emails, right, for this discussion forum. Please feel free to go and change your subscription if you don't want to get those emails every time someone posts in the, in the, in the forum. You can, I put on optional so you can go and you can change your settings for the forum so that you're not subscribed to it anymore and so you're not getting those email notifications all the time. Some students in the past have told me they like to be subscribed because then it reminds them, right, that they've got to do that, that Moodle post. And so they also are getting the other people's discussion postings along the way and can be selecting a classmate, reading them, thinking about it, right, and it helps them select the classmate to reply to. So once again, I did subscribe to everybody this morning, right, when I, after I sent out the prompt. And so if you start in your, in your email that's linked to your Moodle account, you start, start getting all these emails, you can change your, your settings so that you're not subscribed to our Moodle discussion forum. Some people like to have that, so it's a reminder, uh, a reminder that they need to do it. And so once again, that left it as optional. You can take care of that as your own personal preference. Questions about that? Awesome. Thanks to you who already posted. Uh, we're off to a great, a great start. All right, so 2A is a little bit different than our, my 1B class because we didn't get to the softball pop-up on that Tuesday. We did get to it on Thursday, so that means we pushed back the algebra challenge question to this weekend. So let's go ahead and include our algebra challenge question. I'll start the stapler, and we'll go ahead and do our book work on top, algebra question, uh, challenge question statement on the bottom. Yep, derivative proving derivative worksheet is already part of OTL number five. So the proving derivatives is already part of it. So you have three things you're stapling. Click, right? Three things you're stapling. Marissa? So, yeah, you can attack the uh, hatching, book work, proving derivatives, and also the challenge. Oh, that's yeah. yeah. one. So, I don't know if I Yes. Well, let's see. So we've got half sheet because it has graphs. We've got book work, right? We've got book work. Then we've got our proving derivatives, which is already part of algebra challenge worksheet. And lastly, dun 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 dun, dun we've got our algebra challenge question now included. For a grand total of 18, the order doesn't matter. What matters is that you have your total and can have a score on top round to the nearest half point zero to two. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, after you staple, after you staple your four pieces of paper together, 
Make sure that your name, 2A, and number 5 are clearly on top of your OTL. Make sure your infinite canvas score is boxed, round to the nearest half point, 0 to 2, please. And then pass from the back to the front, front row, make sure they're facing the same direction. And we're almost there. Pass that middle, support for more. Yes. It should be underneath the I can put Last call, everybody got your hotel number five? Yeah. All right, I think this is going to now finally catch up our, our mix up schedule. 2A and 1B should be now together. Now we've got your algebra challenge question to take care of. Awesome. So I'm super excited about today because we're not just going to get rules that allow us to calculate derivatives. We're then going to use those derivatives to do something. Yes, that's right. We're going to apply derivatives in the context of rectilinear motion. Now, rectilinear motion, before you break out laughing, is just a fancy way of saying straight line motion. So sometimes some AP application problems on the AP exam involve a particle moving back and forth right along the line in accordance with some position function. Right, which in turn has a associated velocity function and acceleration, all of which can be used to describe that particle's motion. Right? It could be an abstract particle moving along the x-axis, or it could be a snail, right, moving it back and forth along the, the log, or it could be uh, it could be uh, a yo-yo, right, going back and forth, right, uh, as somebody is performing a trick. And so we've got all these different ways that we can we can interpret this in context. And so I'm excited to finally be using our derivatives to do something. We've got an opportunity to earn stamps in several places. So everybody wants to get those. Our stamp eligible exercises include 4B, 5C, 8A, 10C, and 14. We will be coming together for our closure today, okay? And so we need a good, maybe a little bit more than five minutes, and so we're going to be aiming for about 11.24, or about 11.23, 11.24, depending upon where you are. We will be working on a cooperative learning group activity, and then we'll come together for, uh, for our closure at the end. What questions you guys have about what the rest of the day is going to look like? Then let's go ahead and scoot into our groups. I'll pause the recording, and I'll be around momentarily to start issuing stamps. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for turning the desk back. I want you to know that we used, we used the summary questions then for our closer slide today. So if you'd like to complete this right in your summary packet, that's fine. If you'd like to do it on your, on your note sheet, that's fine too. But please know that our velocity, our velocity and our acceleration are functions that describe right, our particle's behavior just like position is a function. What we wanted to do today was determine the relationship between those, those three. Namely, position, velocity, and acceleration. Let's go ahead and describe our velocity v of t. Right? Let's describe our velocity v of t using that y equals f of t notation from your, from your activity. So it said f of t, right? On your, on your summary, it doesn't say f of t for position. So one way to write velocity v of t would be the first derivative of position. That would be f prime of t. So we can use prime notation, right? That, that apostrophe there, f prime of t, refers to the first derivative of position with respect to time. That is velocity. That's the velocity function. We also have Leibniz notation. Leibniz notation uses d's for derivatives. And so Leibniz notation, if we're given a function f for v of t, that would be rewritten as df dt. The derivative of f with respect to time would be rewritten as df dt. So that's an alternate way of writing 
the last thing. You saw in your activity that speed was given by the absolute value of velocity. So S of t could be rewritten as the absolute value of V of t, which in turn equals the absolute value of F prime of t, or you guessed it, the absolute value of the derivative of position with respect to time. All of those mean the same thing. All of those mean the same thing. We just have to be comfortable moving back and forth between different notations as different texts, courses, professors, etc. use different notation for derivative. What's the relationship between acceleration and position, right? Acceleration and position. Abby? Um, the derivative of Absolutely. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity, which makes it compare how to position. Paige? If my acceleration is the first derivative of a velocity, right? Yeah. Then how does that acceleration compare with my original position? The second derivative. The second derivative. Good. So how can we write acceleration then? We could write that a couple of different ways. We could do f double prime of t, which is equivalent to v prime of t. Ultimately, we've got Leibniz notation, which looks a little bit funky with the exponents. Ready? It's not exponents. It's a notation. Ready? So we say d2 f dt squared would be one way of writing that. That's the second derivative of position function f with respect to time, which would all also equal the single derivative of velocity with respect to time. So that would be dv dt. And then the moral of the story, we found that regardless of sign uh, or increasing or decreasing position, we know that object is speeding up when position and velocity have what? Kobe? Same sign. Same sign. So V of T and A of T, same sign. And it's going down when, Riley? When they have opposing signs. Good. So we've got V of T and A of T, opposite signs. Way to go, you guys. Great work today. I'll go ahead and save the notes. Have a wonderful day. Provide your much work and service.